Hi, Ian. <laughs> um, thank you everyone for joining us today um, as part of Motivational Monday Talks with Tankstream Labs and Pixstar. Um, for those who are just joining us for the first time, my name is Anita Backham and I'm the Head of Events at Tankstream Labs. So who are Tankstream Labs? Um, we are a co-working space for tech startups with a global focus. So we have three offices across Australia, um, two in Sydney and one in Perth. Um, we started in 2012. Um, we were founded by Tim Fung, who was a co-founder and CEO of Airtask here as well. He wanted a place, um, a workspace for him and his entre entrepreneurial friends to collaborate and work out of. So that's how Tankstream Labs um, was created in 2012. 2012. Now, a little bit about Pickstar as well. Um, so, Pickstar is the best place to book sports stars for guest speaking appearances, social influencers, marketing, and more. They have over 1,500 athletes and sports personalities on their platform um, and are suitable for any idea and any budget. So, to find out more about Pickstar, please go to pickstar.com.au. That is P I C K S T A R.com.au. So again, thank you everyone for joining us in today's session. Um, this will be a recorded session as uh, for your information and we are also live on Facebook as well. Now, before I go and introduce our guests, which you can see on your screen uh, now as well, just a little bit more about why Motivational Monday talks, what it is and why we do this every Monday. So at Tangstream Labs, we believe that it is vitally important in keeping the community motivated during these trying times. And we do place a high importance of staying motivated and looking after your mental health. So this Motivational Monday Talks is part of our Motivational Mondays program with TSL. So every Monday, we offer free online meditation sessions at 9 a.m. that is open to the public, followed by our Motivational Monday Talks at 12 p.m., where you hear from different leading sports stars and prominent industry leaders and their inspiring stories. So for any future, um, future events, please visit our website at tankstreamlabs.com for more info. Now, I would love to introduce our guest speaker today. This is John Buchanan. He is a former Australian cricket team coach, but he's not just any coach. He's actually one of the most successful coaches the Australian cricket team has seen uh, with a winning record of over 75%. So John coached the um, team from 1999 to 2007 until world record number of straight test matches, 16 wins, 21 consecutive one day international victories and won two World Cups and 24 games undefeated. Amazing. That's, that's amazing. It's really impressive. And I'm a little bit starstruck. So uh, if I'm a little bit nervous, then you'll know why. Um, so John, if you just want to begin, just introduce yourself. I'm pretty sure everyone on the call knows who you are. Um, if you just want to give a little bit um, a background and a snapshot of yourself, that would be great. Well, thanks very much, Nader, and uh, welcome everybody. The, this morning this is a fantastic initiative uh, from yourselves at Tankstream, so very pleased to be part of it. Um, look, I, I thought um, what might be best uh, today, and given the circumstances that we're in, I'll talk a little bit about myself, which I'm not used to, to doing, or I don't particularly uh, necessarily spend a lot of time doing, but um, it, it's it's really about trying to give uh, you some insights into a, a journey. And as you can see behind me, there's a bit of a picture of uh, Mount Everest. And um, I suppose as I talk through my story, you, you'll see why that becomes a little bit more relevant as we go along. But look, two things I really just wanted to uh, say today, and that is one about allowing yourself to dream. And then the second is what, you know, in a sense, why, but what's the power of dreaming? So. Let me take you through through my dreaming a little bit and uh, and the power of it, and then um, yeah, we can hopefully get a couple of questions at the end. So well, yes, and I, so for those who are watching, there is a question. There's Q and A section, and there's a chat box. So please utilise that during the talks, and we'll definitely get through to that. Sorry, John, I'll let you continue. Right out. Good. Thanks, Anita. Um, so look, um, many many moons ago, I, I was a little boy in the backyard, and I had this wonderful dream that I was going to play cricket for Australia. You know, Australians wear this baggy green cap and so that was my dream, that was where I was going and I really pursued that for uh, probably uh, 24, 25 years of, of my life, uh, having played for Queensland but in the end um, unfortunately skill went one direction and ambition was going the other direction so it was that dream um, unfortunately just didn't uh, eventuate but in the course of that dream I was able to, to get a degree and, um, and, and got married and 
And so really that began to create a new dream for me because I then pursued administration or sports administration. So I became a recreation officer. I joined the Commonwealth Games in Brisbane in 1982 and, and then became a national director of Australian volleyball. So I thought my dream would be to be one of the great sports administrators of all time, which would take me around the world and into exciting places. But one of those exciting places wasn't Canberra for me and my wife. And uh, volleyball said, well, we're going to move the office to Canberra. So I said, well, I'm sorry, that, that dream seems like it's gone as well. So I then embarked on um, a teaching degree. I got a diploma of teaching at TAFE and started teaching there. But it wasn't necessarily fulfilling exactly what I was looking for in teaching. So we decided with two young children to head to Canada, uh, where I got a Master's of uh, Sports Administration and a Master of Organisational Theory um, and brought that back to become a lecturer University of Canberra and of course that was that was fantastic um, again the, the dream there was about well I'll become a professor and uh, nothing better than um, you know university days apart from sometimes when students arrive you know if you can keep students off campus it's a great place to be um, but I pursued that uh, that dream for uh, a couple of years but of course what was happening in the academic world was that PhDs became really important because that was the way that you gained research money that was the way that you really began to place um, a profile, if you like, on the institution. So it did require me to go back to do some study and I thought, well, this is not for me. Um, trying to do more study with three young children by this stage. Um, so as it turned out, um, eventually got a job back in, in Queensland within the, uh, the public service, within the Queensland government, within the tourism, sport and racing department. And uh, I was managing a few different programs in there. And again, the dream started to emerge So well, this is not too bad, I can rise through the ranks and I'll become a Director General of Sport. How, how good would that be? And so I, I continued that uh, dream as long as I potentially could, but began to realise there was a lot of blocks along the way. There was a lot of um, um, not necessarily reward for either hard work or creativity. And then, then of course, uh, along came a job advertised for the Queensland Sheffield Shield or Bulls coach in 1994 and uh, that was a real uh, watershed moment in my life because to that point I had never really considered myself a coach albeit that I'd worked with a whole lot of little teams and we'd achieved certain things and by this stage I was uh, a father of uh, five and and so that's an incredible uh, journey in itself. Fortunately uh, the, uh, the head coach, my wife, was doing a fantastic job and I was learning to be a coach at the same stage um, as a parent. But um, that job came up and it made me just stop and think, why do I do what I do? How do I go about what I do? What are my cornerstones? What are my beliefs? And so on. And so I was able to present that to um, uh, Queensland Cricket and was given the job of head coach of the Queensland team. So in a sense, the dream was no longer about me in a, in a way. The dream was really about how do we take this group of individuals, this team, and take them somewhere where they hadn't been before. And of course, Queensland at that point in time in 94 had never won a Sheffield Shield, 69 years of trying. And um, so their uh, desire obviously was always to win this thing called the Holy Grail. But for me, it was about trying to create uh, a more significant dream within the organisation. And that was that we were going to dominate domestic cricket for the next 10 years. And somewhere in there we'd win a Sheffield Shield. As it turned out, we won it the first year and, and I stayed with Queensland for another uh, five years till the Australian job came along and uh, hence the, the, um, the image in the background because, again, the, the dream wasn't necessarily about me, about being the, the best or the, the most winning coach, as Anita was pointing out beforehand. But the dream was, again, to take this Australian cricket team somewhere where they hadn't been before. And so... The picture that I created in their mind was this notion of Everest, that we we're all going to go on a journey to Everest together, didn't know how long it would be, didn't know how long uh, it would take us to get there, whether we could be successful or not. Um, but the concept of Everest was that we were going to do, do things differently, we were going to change the game. And so by the time that we all sort of left the game, that hopefully we would be given a label because of the things that we'd done in cricket. And a bit like related to two of the famous Australian cricket teams of 1948, the Invincibles. So not that we would be called the Invincibles, but hopefully something, um, you know, akin to that. So 
we we did achieve some special things, and we probably got very close to an Everest. But in my term, in, in my belief, it was time for me to move on. It was time for me to create my own dreams again. Um, and that was really because I think I had 15 years of professional coaching, and, and in my mind, that that was a shelf life well and truly extended possibly beyond where it should have been. And so it was time to then take all those sort of lessons and experiences and knowledge and so on and go into my own startup, which was, this was now in 2007 and I created Buchanan Success Coaching, which really is a coaching and leadership business to try to create high performance outcomes either for the individual, the coach or the team. And so that's really what I've been pursuing ever since. Particular startup is still going. I'm still operating the business, um, and I'm still enjoying my new dream. And, and the dream that I kicked off back then was well, I don't know whether many of you on the call or recall a person by the name of Red Adair, but back in the probably the 60s or the 70s, um, when there were oil fires or oil well fires around the world, they used to call on this guy Red Adair, and he would be able to uh, plug up the oil fires and, and put them out. And, so whenever there was something serious, that would call in Red Adair. So my dream, and my dream still is, that I'll be the Red Adair of, of coaching mm -hmm. in the leadership world. And, uh, so I'm still chasing that, that, uh, that journey. Um, so, so that's kind of the journey. And, and so my message is, is definitely uh, continue to dream and give yourself time to dream. Now, the, the, the power of the dream, I think, um, is, is really important um, because... For me, what it's enabled me to do, I suppose, is in every situation that I find myself, it still enables me to be innovative or creative or seek ideas. You know, I think mm -hmm. that's that's really important in no matter what we're doing, uh, that we're somehow trying to look at an issue or a problem or a situation or an opportunity, maybe through a slightly different set of eyes. So, so I think that's important. Um, I, as I said, I, I think what dreaming has always enabled me to do when I'm interacting with a group of people um, is to inspire them or challenge them or create a picture um, that really does give them a sense that we could do something special here. Now, obviously, then it's a little bit around how do we do that, put all that together, but, but nonetheless, it's still around, around doing that. And finally, I suppose, the last thing it does is, you know, I'm, I'm now 67 and... Uh, it still keeps my mind active. It still uh, challenges me. It still wants me to get up every day and, and know that there's something exciting potentially could happen or will happen or can I make it happen? So, so firstly, in summary, dream. Give yourself time to dream. Find a space where you can dream and then realise that never stop the dream because some dreams, as I said, are, are going to come and go. But if you give yourself that opportunity to dream, you'll dream of something else and it just keeps your mind active and keeps you in a good place. So uh, that would be my little story and journey of, of uh, where I've been so far in Ada. Awesome. So you, and the big thing that I took away from that is you continuously have your own Everest. Um, you always had the Everest that you aim to climb or to conquer. Um, and, you know, and I think that's really, really important. Even though you've had different um, experiences throughout your life, you always had that one constant of this is my Everest now, this is what I want to achieve. That's fantastic. Um, so I guess, John, look, I think everyone is really curious. I mean, you've, like I said, they're really impressive stats, even though you downplay it, but um, they're, they're amazing achievements um, to, to have achieved. So I guess we want to, and I'm sure everyone wants to hear about it, um, the story behind you coaching the Australian cricket team um, to, to all the successes um, during your, your tenure from 1999 to 2007. Um, it is a long time, so maybe just in a short summary, um, just explain the highlights of the experience from what you've um, learned from coaching a successful Australian cricket team. Uh, well, look, again, uh, go back to that first meeting I had with the Australian team, which was 1999. And that's where, as I said before, uh, created this notion of Everest and that we're all going to go on that journey. So mm -hmm. um, I think in terms of uh, putting a very talented group of people together, firstly, I, I still believe that, you know, they're only scratching the surface. So I just believed in anything, everything that we're doing, you know, whether it's your technical skills or their physical skills, 
their mental uh, capacity or even their tactical knowledge. And then, and then how do they operate as a, as a team, the culture and so on? Everything could be improved. And so that was always my uh, desire to do that. Now, now some of that works, some of it doesn't work. Uh, you know, I've received criticism for some of the things I do, but nonetheless, as a, as a leader or a coach, uh, what becomes really important is that you have to have a, you know, that clear picture about what it is that you're trying to achieve and then stick with it. And, and sometimes that will bring you into conflict. Sometimes that will mean you'll lose your job. I mean, a couple of my coaching uh, uh, forays in England and, and uh, in India, um, you know, I still adopted the same approach with different people, but it, it just didn't work. It just didn't. Um, gel with the group that I had, and so I you know, was a successful, lost my job. But I, I think one of the things that I learned through that is that I didn't necessarily compromise who I was. I stuck with my values and my principles, and I think that's always so important. But it, it can lead you into unfortunately losing your job sometimes. So that, that was always um, driving what I did. And then, of course, to do the sort of things that we did, you have to have special people. You have to have game changers in your team. And we, of course, had some game changers in the likes of Warren and McGrath and Bill Aspie and uh, Gilchrist, uh, the War Brothers and so on. So wonderful players. Um, and again, my job was not to necessarily show them exactly how they should play the game because they were far better than I was at the game. But my job was to extend them, to challenge them, to feel that they were still only learning the game themselves lots of things, a lot more things to learn about their game so they could get better and better. And so in any team, I mean, one of the, the secrets is just that, that you, you're really trying to ensure that your individual players become their own best coaches. So, so in other words, in, in a sense, that becomes their Everest. If they can become their own best coach, then that means that they can make very good decisions on their own when it's required, which is generally in the heat of battle. And, and then, of course, if they set that as a benchmark, then they know that they can keep improving that. So um, that's what I sought to do with, with the players. Uh, we introduced, when I mentioned that first time starting with Queensland back in 94, we introduced computers for the first time in sport. Uh, not because I'm, I'm a, a computer nerd, I'm, I'm far from it. I'm, I'm struggling <laughs> with all technologies. But um, I, do, I guess I do realise that technology is a tool and, and provided that you can uh, harness the tool properly, you can provide great insights and advice, analysis and feedback uh, to your players or to your team or to your staff. And so it was just about trying to harness the power of the computer so that we could provide that sort of information back into the, the teams. And of course, like everyone, some people love it, some people don't like it, and there's a lot of people who are a bit ambivalent about it. So it's always um, trying to experiment with the best ways and means of getting the information to the individual so that it's of benefit to them. Um, so, you know, without sort of picking on particular highlights, but um, um, probably one final very quick story for you that, that might emphasise exactly what I was saying, was that in 2005, we went to England and lost an Ashes series. And of course, Australians can't uh, lose to the Poms. That's, we can do a lot of things in our-, in our we can't do that. <laughs> that. We can't do that. Um, so uh, coming back from that series, I've been with the Australian team six years, it was time to change the coach and change the captain, do a whole range of things. Um, it made me stop and, and well, rethink or revisit or review, reflect really on, on what had been happening and then what I was going to do to present to the board to say why well, I should still be there, which I was able to do, convince them that I could. And so stayed on for the next 20, 20 months. And so what that was about was re-imagining, uh, if you like, what this Everest looked like over that 20 months. And we had three um, incredible tournaments uh, towards the back end. One was in uh, August in India, an ICC trophy we never won. That England was coming back to Australia and we had an opportunity to obviously uh, take back the Ashes if we played well enough. And then um, finishing up in April was the 2007 World Cup in the West Indies, which would mean if we won that, that was going to be three in a row. So the Everest was conquering those big three, the trophy, the Ashes and then the World Cup all together, which had never been done in history before. So wow. that was kind of what was driving it. The overarching strategy was we were going to be the best skilled team the world had ever seen. Um, I, we didn't actually ever become that, but we came very close to being the, well, certainly better skilled than most of the teams we played. And in the end, we were able to, to climb that, uh, that final Everest. 
Awesome. That's fantastic. And I can see there's a couple of questions that's come through from um, the audience here. And um, yeah, I just, I do need to answer some questions, John. So before yes. we go back, um, we've got a question from Adam here. He asked, what was your favourite test series? Favourite test series? Well, um, I think your favourite, in a sense, is always the first time you do something. Um, so I debuted in 99 in Brisbane, in November, and uh, we were playing Pakistan. At that stage. So that was my first test series. Uh, there was a guy, Adam Gilchrist, who was a keeper. That was his first uh, test match as well. Um, and, and we won it 3-0. And that was the beginning of a, a 16 in a row uh, record uh, test consecutive uh, victories as well. But your first, I think, is always uh, pretty special. But um, one, another one was 2004 in India because we were, we were able to beat India in India, which was the first time in 39 years. First two at England in 2001 Ashes under Stephen Moore was an incredible Ashes series. And then, of course, uh, as I just mentioned, to regain the Ashes 2006 7 and the way that we played. And that was the swan song of Warren and, uh, and uh, soon to be McGrath. He went to the World Cup after that. But yeah, they were, they were special. But in a sense, every Test match was so special. And, and it was just such a privilege to be a part of it. And that's what think is, is so important within Australian ranks and we may have lost our way there a little bit for the last four or five years when it uh, eventually uh, uh, sort of boiled over in, in Sandpaper Gape in, in Cape Town but I think again that's that's returning and um, it's so important that it does because it is a privilege to uh, represent your country. Yeah definitely it definitely sounds like an adventure uh, was had as well during those times. Um, I, guys, I know we've got about five minutes left to the session, so please put down your answers. Luke, I can see you've raised your hand. I will get to you in a second. I just want to come back to the conversation with John before we open it to the rest of the floor, because um, what you said um, really resonated, I think, uh, with those who are watching now, those in startups and small businesses, when you said um, the word game changer. So recognizing game changes and encouraging them to be the best that they can. I think um, in these circumstances now, a lot of startups and a lot of small businesses um, are realizing who the game changers are and that how big of a, like with staff, they need to have the right people on the team um, you know, to help them grow and also to help them um, get out of the situation that we're currently in. So my question to you is how can leaders or managers, one, look for those game changers or realise who they are and then nurture them to become the best that they can be? Yeah, sure. Look, um, it's not necessarily that hard but it's not necessarily that easy i mean in a sense game changes you know they could be in sales they, they could be in it they could be in marketing they could be uh, um, at the reception desk you know uh, they just do things that other people either cannot do or don't even think to do um, and and you can tell you can see that in them and uh and so they're the sort of people that you, you want to try and bring into your business, your organisation. Uh, but of course, game changers often are very uh, self-focused people as well, because that's potentially why they're as good as what they are, because they, they are so good. They want to demonstrate that to everybody as much as they possibly can and don't necessarily have the concept of team and looking after everybody else around them, because in a sense, it's all about me, the game changer. You know, I'm so good. So give me every opportunity to demonstrate that. So as a leader in a, of, of a group of people, while you need game changers in there, you've got to recognise that they can bring some potentially divisive um, uh, sort of attitudes or characteristics or actions and behaviours uh, that they are probably not aware of sometimes into the mix and it will be the way that they affect other people. So really need to be able to work as closely as you can with those people. But ultimately, what we did within the Australian cricket team, because we did have a, a few of those in our midst, um, and I don't necessarily need to go into names, but you know, one happens to be a blonde-headed leg spinner who came from Victoria, uh, who was one of the great, greatest leg spinners of all time. Um, but gradually, we're able to put uh, a peer group around him. So peer management becomes really important in terms of how you can manage uh, game changes. Um, because I'll, generally, the game changer, when things are not going well, will not at 
they all listen to the coach or the captain or whoever those senior figures will be. Um, but more will be influenced by people around. Yeah. Yep. No, definitely. And we've got a question um, from Craig as well. So what expertise and experience did you look for in advisors when you started your business? This is in relation to your um, Yes. Yes, look, um, I, I guess when I um, tend to look back on it, I, I reckon I made a lot of mistakes early on. Um, you know, I thought in a sense that I certainly had some really good content, if you like, or really good experience, really good knowledge sets. Um, I, I did have some good networks that I could begin to access, but I don't think I really uh, spent sufficient time understanding how to run a business. You know, so um, in sport uh, or in, in a sense in celebrity land, and not that I'm saying I was a celebrity, but when you finish coaching the Australian career team, at least you have some sort of profile in the countryside. Um, I don't believe that I, I really leveraged that well enough. I wasn't really prepared well enough to take as best advantage of that as possible. So going to your notion of advisors, yeah, look, I think um, people who have been in business for some period of time, have been through the ups and downs of business, uh, are really good advisors. You need that sort of experience. And it's the same as a cricket team, you know, that if we were gonna do something special, we needed that knowledge and experience in there. It, it's it's too difficult for a whole group of young people to take on the world, if you like, because it, there's no no replacing knowledge and experience. So I think wherever you can um, track down uh, appropriate knowledge and appropriate experience, and and those that you respect, that's the place to go. Yeah, definitely look for look for advisors and those who have more experience than you have. Um, and they'll be able to show you the lessons that they learnt so you don't make the same mistake they did. Awesome. Well, we've come to the end of the session, John. Just got one last question for you. Um, during these times, how do you, what advice can you give to everyone to stay motivated? Yes. Um, well, in short, I think um, if you just reflect on your personal best day, whenever that might have been. Could have been yesterday, might have been a couple of weeks ago, or it could be a project, um, you know, or a task that you perform. But when you reflected on it, you said to yourself, wow, I couldn't do much better than that. So that's a bit like an athlete uh, who has a great day out and says, well, that's my PB. So I think for, for everybody, that's really the starting point because in there, you did a lot of things to enable that to occur. You know, everybody talks about control of controllables. Well, that's what you did. So you, you had certain technical skills that you were using to enable you to get to that outcome that day. You had certain physical skills that enabled you because you either were up for the, the day or, you know, you were ready for the day or you'd recovered from the previous day, so you're ready to go. So certain physical skills, your, your mental skills, you know, you were just tuned in, you were locked in, you're in the flow, you're in the zone, all those sort of terms. And, and you do that by switching on and switching off and, and you've got your own routine. And of course, with the clear mind, which is switching on and switching off, it kind of gets rid of all the distractions and the noise that's around you. That enables you then to drop into, yes, your smorgasbord of tricks or your smorgasbord of tools, which again, can be knowledge, experience, intuition. But again, it may simply be just finding a way around a computer and, and where you need to access the information you need. So, so that would be my advice to, to keep yourself ready for each day what are my key reference points, which is what I've just mentioned, that give me best chance of having a, a really good day, right? There's no guarantee because it, there's always lots of things that, that can get in the road of that. But you've got to put yourself in the right position to do that. So for me, that's how you begin to, if you like, keep yourself uh, on track for having a really good day. And if you do that, uh, then you're a chance and that's how you continue day after day after day. Awesome. I think that's really good words, good parting words from John here. You know, remember your personal best days and remember how you got there to keep yourself motivated and to keep going. 
That's a great analogy. I like that one. <laughs> well, um, thank you so much for your time today, John. We really appreciate sure. it. Um, and this is Monday Motivational Talks. Every Monday at 12 p.m., Tankstream Labs in partnership with Pixstar. Join us 12 p.m. next Monday and see who the next guest star will be. But thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And, John, thank you again for your time. Thank you and good luck to everybody. Stay healthy. Thanks, Neil. Bye, now.